Lisa talked about a song that I showed her when we were in Nashville, the chorus of Trouble in Mind. And when I first, um, I put my band together in the early 90s, like right around 1990, started playing out in 91. And I'd played with a folk rock band called Stealing Horses on Arista Records before that. And although I'd always played electric guitar, most of the performing that I had done had been acoustic folk rock music uh, with other singer-songwriter singer songwriters. I play guitar and do co-writing and do backing vocals. And so I, I have a real love for the acoustic guitar. And um, so when I put my own band together, I had, uh, towards the end of my stay with Stealing Horses, uh, right before Albert King died, I was working as a bartender in Nashville. Uh, I was off the road. I was with Stealing Horses two and a half out of four years. I was with him twice. So in between the two times that I was there, I was working as a bartender and playing shows on the side and, and stuff. And Albert King was going to play. And I, I knew who Albert King was, but I really, everybody knows who B.B. King is. And uh, Freddie King was what was my favorite of the three. My guitar teacher, when I first started taking guitar lessons, I came in with my electric guitar and my Kiss records and a Peter Frampton record. <laughs> and my guitar teacher's like, oh, God. <laughs> And uh, he said, well, if you ever really want to learn how to play guitar, you'll discover Roy Buchanan and Freddie yeah. King. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. And Freddie King, I just, I really grew to love, and he, he gave me a bunch of that stuff. But Roy Buchanan ended up being my, my favorite guitar player of all times. I mean, as much as I love Jimi Hendrix, I like Roy Buchanan even more. And I got to meet Roy just a couple of months before he died. And when I did Down by the River, obviously that is a Neil Young song, but I, I learned that song on an instrumental record that Roy Buchanan uh, put out called You're Not Alone. And that's where I fell in, the, in love with the song Down by the River. And I used to do that with the band a lot. And I hadn't done it for a number of years, and so that was, was fun to reconnect with that. But Roy Buchanan and then Albert King, they were two very influential guitar players. And when I was bartending that night, Albert King came in and they were doing sound check and he had two sold out shows. And I was just young enough and just stupid enough to ask him, can I sit in? You know. That was the first thing that always came out of my mouth. He, said, he looked around and Warren Haynes with the Almond Brothers now, he used to play in a band called Blues Co-op and I used to sit in with him a lot. And Warren was a friend of mine. And, uh, Anyway, they said, well, yeah, she plays. And he goes, you show up with a guitar, and I'll let you play. <laughs> and since I worked there, you know, I could get in and get backstage and talk to him. And so I come in, I brought my amp and everything. <laughs> and I was ready to go. And it didn't really dawn on me that, you know, he's one of the greatest guitar players, and this was Nashville, lots of guitar players. And it didn't, didn't even dawn on me. And so anyway, I went backstage, which is a little green room off next to the kitchen. And this, this place I worked was called the Cuckoo's Nest. And the guy that owned this place had it for a short time because he didn't have any sense. He had designed the light bulbs that you turn on and off at Kmart checkout lanes. He made all this money and he had a place called the Cuckoo's Nest and it was. But it was open for about eight months and I bartended and I got to play with Albert. But anyway, I, I go back and I think my guitar and it was after his first set and before his second show. I stuck my head in the door. I said, Mr. King, I brought my guitar. You said I could play. And he looked at me and he was sitting there and he had a suspenders on. He had a sheriff's badge on his suspenders and he had a pistol in his lap. <laughs> I said, Mine. And he said, Come in here and we'll see what you got. Unfortunately, I, I had an old strat. And um, he said, Let me, what you got? So I played a little bit and he goes, Hmm. He said, I helped Steve Ray. And I taught that boy how to sing, and made him sing, and he had to sing. And he talked about Cher. I wasn't quite sure what he was talking about when it came to Cher. Something about, she never said thank you, and you're like, I'm just there listening, you know, and I was like, wow, okay. Anyway, they came back to get him, they said, it's time to go, you got like, you know, two or three minutes. He said, you go on out there without me and kick off the show. <laughs> And that's when he stood up. 
and he was taller than my father. My dad's six four, and I mean, he was at least probably six six. He was a big man. He looked down at me. He said, "Don't you make me ashamed." <laughs> <laughs> well, I got scared. <laughs> I felt like I was in fifth grade again at church, having to sing. I had to sing "Jesus Loves Me" in Chinese once. <laughs> One of those kinds of experiences your mom puts you up to something and, and you have to do it. You can't say no because, you know, next thing you know, they, they announce you and you have to go up there and do something. So I was terrified at that point. I go out and it's like, well, what am I going to do? You know, all the times I thought, I don't have to learn how to play blues. That's easy. It's like, it wasn't feeling really easy. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I kicked the night off and uh, he kept me up there the whole night. He screamed at me a few times. I said, that's a night court. I know this is not cool. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he kept me up there all night and he left me up there. And um, that, and I remember Warren Haynes was in the crowd and I went straight up to Warren and I said, What do I need to listen to? <laughs> he said, I'll make you a list. And he did. He did. And um, that was the beginning of what planted a seed for me for the blues. And so I started listening back to all these old records, and I started hearing all these songs that I thought Led Zeppelin had written. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, listen to this. I was playing it for everybody, and they were looking at me like, yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know who Willie Dixon was. I didn't know who Muddy Waters I mean, I'd heard of Muddy Waters, but I didn't know anything about Muddy Waters. And so I discovered all this music, and all of a sudden, it began to make sense why the black gospel music that I like, I like so much. And why the music I was drawn to was so blues-based. Zeppelin, Hendrix, my favorite record by Hendrix was Jimi Hendrix Blues, which was released after, long after his death. But there's uh, a song that I learned, I remember uh, in 1990. It was one of those turning points in my life to where everything just came apart. Everything just totally came apart, and um, I went back home, and I thought, well, well I went, went back to Nashville, ended up living in Tahlequah, Oklahoma for a while, and uh, when I was still in Stealing Horses, they moved out west, and then I went back to Nashville for a little while, and I remember visiting a friend of mine in Tahlequah, and she had a large walk-in closet with a bed in it, and I made it to her house, and I said, I've just got it. I need a few weeks to just kind of think. She goes, well, there's a closet, and there's a bed, and I had a stereo, and I had Eric Clapton's um, four-disc CD set. And I started learning all of the Clapton tunes I could. I thought, well, I'm never going to sound like Muddy Waters. <laughs> so Clapton, when I had gotten my first pickup truck, somebody gave me an eight-track player. Because <laughs> eight tracks were going out, and I had... Um, you know, when they started going bad, you had to put matches under it and prop it up so it would play. Well, I had a Cream Live 8-track stuck in the player for about three years. <laughs> so not sound at all like Gary Clapton ever. <coughs> There's a reason for that, because for three, four years, all the miles that I drove, that's all I heard. Was <clears throat> and uh, so I remember listening to Mean Old World. Dwayne Almond and Eric Clapton. I love that song, and I'll play that in a few minutes. And um, just started to realize that you know, all these songs, all the chords are the same. <laughs> and what makes them different? <clears throat> what makes all of these songs different? Why is this ball of play so alive? And I realized that you know this was the emotion that I was drawn to, and that I could finally talk and sing through my guitar. And that that's really the types of guitar players that I liked. And so uh, one of the songs that I learned early on was um, Trouble in Mind. It was on an old Alligator 25th anniversary. And it had more chords in it than I was used to playing. And so uh, when I showed Lisa that, I thought, now if you learn this song, it covers every chord you'll ever play in the blues. Because <laughs> it's got five chords in it, and that's unusual. So, I always, I've never heard Billie Holiday do this song, but I've got a poster of Billie Holiday's that was in my studio until recently when I 
moved into a room with all windows. I can't put my posters up. And uh, it was her with the glass. It's kind of a famous poster, glass of some kind of alcohol. And she just didn't look too good, didn't look too happy. And, and I always, that always struck me, you know, how much she felt. And when she sang, I just always could see the pain that I saw in that picture. And so this song, Trouble in Mind, that Pinetop Perkins, I think, maybe did it. I don't, I don't know who did it on Alligator Records, but I learned the song. And then I always would think of Billie Holiday when I do this song. And this one of my favorite blues songs.
Mm-hmm. <laughs>